and North Africa. Let me now welcome and introduce Representative Gabbard for her opening comments. Aloha. I got to tell you, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to be home. It's great to be here uh, in Hilo. Uh, this is number five. Is that right? Number five in our uh, statewide Aloha Town Hall tour. Uh, we had about a two-week district work period in Congress right now where there's no votes happening, so gives us the opportunity to come home and spend time in the district. As some of you may know, uh, I have the unique privilege of representing Hawaii's second district, which includes every single island in the state. Uh, we have... Everything in the state except for the urban corridor of Honolulu proper. <laughs> I didn't know that'd be funny, but. <laughs> uh, on Oahu, we have the east side, the north shore, and the west side, and then we have all of our neighboring islands. So yesterday we were on Molokai, uh, and we have also concluded Kona, uh, Lanai, and tomorrow, and Kailua on Oahu, and then uh, tomorrow morning I fly out to Kauai, and then we will close out the tour uh, with Maui. And then I head back to Washington on Monday, uh, where we will go back into session on Tuesday, the 25th. Uh, so it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience being able to go out and talk story and hear about what's on your mind, uh, to be able to address and answer questions that you may have about legislation that I'm working on, things that are happening in Washington, things you may be seeing on the news and wondering, what is this all about? Uh, so I look forward to the time that we have together. Uh, as Daryl mentioned, uh, there are two major committees that I serve on, Foreign Affairs and Armed Services. So much of the committee work that I do is uh, within those two jurisdictions. But of course, through the legislative work that we do, through the appropriations uh, and funding work that we do, uh, we touch and focus on all of the variety of issues um, that you may be interested in, whether it be healthcare, uh, education, infrastructure, uh, you can go uh, environment, you can go on uh, down the list. Uh, I wanna spend as much time as possible on questions, so I'm gonna try to keep this intro brief, uh, but there's one issue that's been in the news quite a bit lately that I wanted to just bring up uh, up front, uh, and that is the issue of North Korea. Uh, and what has been happening there. As Daryl mentioned, I serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Asia Pacific Subcommittee, as well as the Middle East Subcommittee. Uh, and this has been an issue that I focused on quite a bit, actually, ever since I was elected and sworn in as a member of Congress back in January of 2013. Uh, even then, I had recognized the uh, increasing threat and capabilities coming from North Korea and yes, the threat that poses to the United States overall, but more specifically the threat that that poses to us here in Hawaii, given we are uh, the most forward point for our country in the Pacific. We are the closest in proximity to North Korea. What was uh, quite astounding to me uh, on one of the first official congressional trips that I took uh, with other members of Congress to the Asia Pacific region was how few members of Congress are aware of how large the Pacific Ocean is. <laughs> they kept commenting in the plane, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Uh, so it was important for them. They stopped here in Hawaii and, and, and uh, got a sense of a short time, but got a sense of Hawaii and, and where we are. Uh, but they also, prior to this trip, were not even aware that North Korea was a nuclear armed country. Disturbing, to say the least. Senior members of Congress who were traveling on this trip did not know that North Korea was nuclear armed. They were not aware that North Korea has uh, developed over the years intercontinental ballistic missile capabilities that put Hawaii directly within range of those capabilities uh, and that those threats have directly been made. So from that point and continuing on, especially now, I've been very focused on both through the Foreign Affairs and Armed Services Committees, raising this level of awareness uh, and pushing for uh, defense, defense of Hawaii in particular. Uh, given North Korea's most recent actions, most recent escalation, 
Uh, I'm urging my colleagues, my, our Hawaii delegation, our leadership here in the state of Hawaii, and urging all of you to help raise voices as we try to get urgent action to make sure that the appropriate capabilities are in place for the defense and protection uh, of Hawaii uh, in particular. This is something that uh, we can't afford to take lightly. There are a, a number of other issues that I've got all my, my notes scribbled out here, but uh, I wanted to open with that one because it's one that I've gotten a number of questions on uh, and one that specifically falls within my committee jurisdiction uh, to give you a quick update on that. But from here, uh, Daryl, mahalo for your moderating this evening and we can kick off the questions. Thank you. I guess a real quick note on some housekeeping. Apologize, the restrooms are down in the next building, so you go out the back door, down the stairs, turn left, restrooms are out there. All the doors are open. Uh, we know it gets kind of warm, so if you need to step outside and, and you know, observe from outside, please do so. We did have the doors closed earlier because we wanted to funnel the traffic through the front and have people sign in and not miss that opportunity. Uh, lastly, if you got the cell phones, if you don't mind putting them on uh, vibrate or silent mode just so it doesn't uh, disturb or disrupt uh, the evening. And I really want to appreciate the amount of signage that came in this evening. A lot of great signs out there. All I ask is if you please don't mind or be courteous to people behind you so they can see and, and observe as well. Uh, how we're going to do it is I will read uh, a written question as we call on the individual that's going to be asking the live question. And as we're waiting for the microphone to get to Ms. Putnam, I'll just ask one of the questions that was submitted in writing. Why did you go see President Trump and what did you speak about? Glad we're starting with a good question. <laughs> uh, shortly after the general election uh, in November of last year, I was invited to go and meet with then President-elect Trump specifically to talk about uh, an issue that I have been very focused on for years now, which is Syria. Uh, ending the counterproductive regime change war in Syria that Congress and you, the American people, have not uh, authorized or declared. Uh, and to talk about some of the dangers of proposals that were being put forward at the time, and unfortunately that are resurfacing now with regards to what are the costs to our country, to our military, to our taxpayer dollars of something uh, called a no, so-called no-fly zone or safe zone, uh, as well as what are the consequences of these actions, both intended and unintended consequences, specifically within Syria. Uh, much of our conversation focused around Syria. We also talked about uh, terrorist threats coming from groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda uh, and other issues uh, within the Middle East. My goal in that meeting was to try to provide uh, some influence and some insight on uh, my strong views on these issues and why they're so important for us here at home uh, in the hopes of uh, basically trying to get to him before the neocon war hawks who were beating their war drums were able to exercise their influence over him. Unfortunately, as we've seen over the last 10 days or so, um, I think they were successful. I've been very outspoken in uh, criticizing and calling out his missile strike against Syria as being reckless and careless and an escalation of this regime change war in Syria and one that Congress has not authorized. You know, when, when people ask me sometimes, Tulsi, why are you focused on Syria and why is that important to us here at home? When we have challenges here in our community, why should I care about what's happening over there? And I remind folks about the cost of these wars and the consequences of our policies. That when you look at our country's regime change wars, whether it was Iraq, Libya, or now in Syria, and the trillions of dollars, your dollars, that have been spent on these wars, there is a direct connection between where those dollars have been spent and the difficulty and lack of resources that we have here at home to fund things like our public schools, to take care of our infrastructure, to help protect our environment, to help improve our healthcare system, 
to take care of folks who are living on the streets and without homes, to deal with so many of the challenges that we have here at home. You cannot separate these two issues, which is one of the reasons I've been fighting against these regime change wars. Wars that have cost hundreds of thousands of people their lives. Wars that have created millions of refugees and wars that have ultimately resulted in strengthening terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, counterproductive to our national security interests, what to speak of the American lives that have been lost. So for so many reasons, uh, it's critical for each of us to understand the connection, to understand that we cannot afford to be the world's police. That even with the best of intentions, our actions have so often, again, Iraq, Libya, and Syria, our actions have resulted in more human suffering, not less. Our actions have resulted in more destruction, not less. And this is why it's important for us to stand up now, especially at a time when people in both political parties and when people in the media are applauding this president for launching this illegal attack against Syria. This is when our voices are critical to stand up and say no. This is where the power base lies in your voices and I ask you to stand with me in making sure that we don't turn a blind eye to this illegal escalation. Kim, did we get you the microphone? Kim Putnam, and uh, I appreciate your stand on this. Uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, that's bad form. That's a no-no. And when we, without a declaration of war, attack another nation, unilaterally on the basis of the president saying attack, we have lost all respect in an international community by doing that act, just the same as Japan, because their diplomats were late, lost the respect and were declared uh, an act of infamy. Well, that was an act of infamy also, a unilateral act without consent of Congress. And I appreciate your stand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. There is a reason why we have a constitution. There is a reason why we have the balance of powers in our government. There is a reason why this War Powers Act exists and we must, in Congress, take back our authority and responsibility on behalf of you to not allow any president to conduct these illegal wars unchecked. Thank you. The next question from the floor is from Danny Lee. Danny, would you mind raising your hand? And as we make our way to Danny, I'll read one of the questions that was submitted. Aloha, I have a sister who is doing eight years for marijuana in a horrible prison in Illinois. What is the decriminalization process looking like in Congress? And what is the likelihood of this happening anytime soon? Thank you. Thank you for that question. And I'm very sorry to hear about your sister and what she's going through and frankly, what too many people are going through in this state and across this country. You know, I recently uh, read an FBI report that came out a few years ago saying that every 42 seconds in this country, someone is arrested for the use or possession of marijuana. Every 42 seconds. So if we think about how long we're just sitting here tonight, think about the human social cost and toll that is taking on our communities. Uh, I've introduced legislation, uh, it's a bill HR 1227, it's a bipartisan bill uh, that I've introduced with a Republican from Virginia, he's actually a very conservative Republican, uh, named Tom Garrett, he is an army veteran and a former prosecutor, but he believes strongly as I do that marijuana has no place on the Schedule One list of the Federally Controlled Substances Act. And when you really look at this issue, it makes no sense that you have marijuana, a substance that has been proven time and again to be far less dangerous than alcohol, treated 
at the federal level at the same way that heroin is treated. You have families being torn apart because of this, people being thrown in jail, their lives being ruined with creating a criminal record. Uh, and, and for what? To what end? It makes absolutely no sense. What to speak of here in Hawaii, and I think it's 26 other states who have legalized in some form or another medical marijuana. 28, thank you, it's 28. Very helpful who have legalized in some form medical marijuana, but who are facing this contradiction between state and federal law, where, you know, I've got local bankers here in Hawaii coming and talking to me, uh, local insurers who provide workman's comp insurance in a quandary about what to do because these are federally regulated industries. And they are literally afraid that if they do business with, directly with any of our dispensaries, or indirectly, maybe with people who work there, that they or their employees will be subject to um, prosecution by the federal government. So they're trying to figure out how to deal with this contradiction between the two. Uh, what to speak of recent statistics that have come out showing that states who have uh, legalized medical marijuana, uh, there has been a uh, up to 30% reduction in opioid-related deaths in those states. And for every year those states have, their, uh, have legalized medical marijuana, fewer and fewer opioid-related deaths occur. So on so many different levels, what to speak of the fiscal impact, when you think about our criminal justice system here in Hawaii, which is the same across the country, if you read the papers every year as the legislative session goes in, there's usually calls for more funding to build new prisons here, uh, new calls for funding to uh, rebuild dilapidated prisons that we have that are very overcrowded. Uh, I went and visited a few of them last month when I was here in Hawaii uh, and had a chance to talk with some of the inmates. And I tell you, I talked to a young girl on Maui who was in prison there and she shared, I don't know anybody. I don't know a single person, she said who does not use drugs. And she told her story of how she ended up in our criminal justice system for the use of drugs. So our current laws are hurting people, not helping people. They're hurting our community, not helping and strengthening our community. And this is an issue where we already have found bipartisan support to be able to change this through passing common sense legislation uh, and we are urging more and more members of Congress to sign on to it. Thank you. Danny, before you ask your questions, I want to announce we have a blue Suzuki licensed ZAT328. It's blocking a car. If that's your vehicle, if you could move it. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you on taking that very tough stand on Syria. I think sometimes it's actually harder to take, you know, as a soldier, it's harder to take, you know, to disobey an illegal order. And I think that you, you did the right thing. Thank I absolutely, you. you know, agree with you 100% on that. Thank now you, the Danny. the ultimate culprit, as you already started to mention, is that this country, the war establishment in Washington, has been fixated on regime change. In other words, going to other countries and, you know, changing their government. And in fact, I would, may I remind everybody, the first regime change started in 1893, right here in Hawaii. So my question is, how do we educate and mobilize more people? Because most of the people still, especially on the continent, do not realize that the American empire is fixated on regime change. If they understand that, I think they'll understand this is not Department of Defense, it's a Department of Offense. Thank you, Danny. Your question is exactly on point. How do you educate people? Because too many people are not aware of what our country's policies have been or the consequences of those policies. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people have um, good intentions and they want to be in a position where they can help people. And they see people suffering in another part of the world and they say, gosh, you know, we want to relieve their suffering. We want to take action to be able to help them. But unfortunately, too often leaders in our country take that action through 
regime change uh, wars that, as I mentioned earlier, end up hurting and increasing these people's suffering rather than actually relieving it. So education is key. Uh, holding leaders who are continuously pushing our country into these regime change wars accountable is key. You know, this was one of the uh, frustrations that I had during the presidential election last year, is that no one in the media was asking and holding accountable people who were running to be our commander in chief in either party. They were not being asked this question specifically. They were not being asked directly their position, what actions they would take. Would they continue and escalate the regime change war in Syria or would they put an end to it? so that the people of Syria could find their way back to stability uh, and peace. So this accountability and this education needs to come from all sectors, and every single one of you has an opportunity to help educate others. And this is critical. I, I, can't, I can't overstate this enough. This is something that I'm trying to continue to do with my colleagues in Congress who are very quick to call for military action, very quick to call for regime change wars. Uh, and these people need to be held accountable for their positions and need to be educated about why it is not good for the people in these countries, as history has proven, and why it is counterproductive to our interests here in the United States as well. You only have to remind people again about the cost. What is the cost of these wars? There are so many needs that our communities have here. We need to focus on investing and rebuilding our communities here at home, not starting more regime change wars in other parts of the world. Okay, our next question from the floor is from Kerry Sullivan. Kerry, could you raise your hand? And as we get the mic to Kerry, what can Hawaii expect from a future without, without, without the EPA? Oh. The question was, what kind of future can Hawaii expect without the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency? Uh, I'm, I'm quite concerned about the deep, deep cuts that uh, the president has proposed in his budget to the EPA. What to speak of the leadership that has been selected to run the EPA, someone who uh, is, uh, appears to be diametrically opposed to the mission of the EPA. Uh, we're gonna be fighting this fight in Congress. As Congress goes through the budget process and goes through the appropriations process, uh, we've got our work cut out for us to be able to continue to advocate for important and basic environmental protections, as well as doing our best to make sure that the protections that exist are not eroded. Uh, but there's a lot that needs to be done here locally as well, frankly, and a few states have started down this path where you know, as you know, the federal law, the federal um, government sets the baseline standard. So the federal law is here, states and counties can't go below it, but you can strengthen it. So I think there's something that we should uh, discuss and talk about and figure out here in Hawaii, where protecting our environment is uh, not just a, a theoretical thing, like, oh, okay, we, of course we should protect our environment. It's a way of life. Here. It's a it, it is part of our culture. It is part of our home. It is part of our family. So we need to look at state laws. We need to look at county ordinance. We need to look within our community at each other, nonprofits, to see what actions can we take that whatever happens nationally, that we make sure that our, our precious resources are protected here, our land, our water, our precious drinking water. Uh, we, we have to uh, try as much as possible to be proactive in this area. Thank you. Uh, my question is, is um, with Congress voting to, uh, for a declaration of war to take us into war, then why can't they vote to take us out? I mean, where does it end, like with Iraq and Afghanistan, and now we're moving on to Syria? I mean, what's the final point where, you know, funding and troops actually stop? Why is there not a bill to allow Congress to take us out of war 
And at least with a roll call, we'll know when it comes election time who was and wasn't against war at what time if that roll call continues on. Yeah, thank you. This, this goes to the, the heart of the issue is that uh, Congress has not voted or authorized this war in Syria. Uh, this war has actually been waged for much longer than you might think. This war against Syria did not begin with President Trump's missile strike a few days ago. It began years before that uh, when uh, our government, your taxpayer dollars, uh, began being used to provide arms, uh, weapons, salaries, intelligence assistance to armed militants within Syria who are working directly with and often under the command of terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda to overthrow the Syrian government. We provided this support indirectly through countries like Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Qatar, who for their own interests wanted to see the Syrian government overthrown and who were providing support to these terrorist groups working towards that end as well. So this illegal regime change war has been waged for years and Trump's missile strike really was an escalation of this illegal war that was never debated on the House floor that you never had a say in and that was never voted on so that you could hold your leaders accountable for it. Part of the problem here is that over the years, Congress has ceded its authority because too many people to, to the executive branch because too many people are afraid of being on the record. They don't want to be held accountable. So I've introduced legislation to deal with the issue that I've just talked about, that the CIA has been waging this war by uh, providing this support directly to armed militants working with terrorist groups. My bill is called the Stop Arming Terrorists Act. And very simply, it would prohibit your taxpayer dollars from being used to provide these armed militant groups who are working with terrorist groups uh, with any type of assistance. And it would also stop your taxpayer dollars from being funneled through countries like Saudi Arabia and Turkey and others uh, who are supporting uh, these same groups. All in this effort to conduct this regime change war for their own interests that are counterproductive uh, to ours. Uh, so I agree with you, Congress needs a vote uh, if the president wants to take our country into war, then Congress needs to exercise its authority in having that debate and representing your voices and having a vote. Thank you. Next question submitted and written. Why did you meet with Assad and what was discussed? The people of Syria are suffering in ways that that you can't even imagine. I met with uh, teenagers, young women, young men, who have uh, personally been tortured, uh, been raped, uh, watched family members killed before their very eyes, uh, all by these different terrorist groups uh, who are continuing this regime change war. People are suffering as a result of the sanctions. I met small business owners, these women who've been best friends since high school, who are now in their 50s, who had a thriving business, uh, sewing and making garments, employed a lot of people. Their business was completely destroyed because of this war, and now they've started to try to pick back up the pieces, but can't because of the sanctions regimes that are in place. There are there is such devastation that has come about as a result of this. And I met with Assad to try to further the cause of understanding and peace. And when it comes right down to it, we cannot further the cause of peace and understanding without meeting we, people who we disagree with, even if they may be our adversaries. We can't just meet with our friends and think that that is going to bring about peace magically somehow. The people of Syria are not interested in politics. They're not interested in these debates that we see between talking heads on TV every day. They're interested in life and peace and a future 
for their kids and their families. That's all they're asking for. They're asking us to stay out of it, to stop fueling this regime change war and let the Syrian people determine the future of Syria for themselves. to say a little bit in the build-up on this, but my basic question is going to be to you after this, is what are you doing to study and prepare yourself for possible impeachment hearings? Because it happens in the House of Representatives, and you're, you're becoming brave. You're obviously a very brave person, even though you're not on uh, one of the intelligence committees. We need someone like you. But, you know, uh, we learned uh, um, Attorney General Sessions uh, basically lied when he said, when he denied that he had met with Russians uh, during the campaign. And then a few weeks later, we learned in February that he um, admitted, oh yeah, that's right, I remember now. I met with the Russians twice. And oh, by the way, the Trump administration paid for my um, plane ticket to go to the Republican convention. And then we learned that not only um, did he meet with the Russian ambassador uh, for the Trump campaign, but also that uh, along with him were um, Manafort and Flynn and um, Carter Page and, and Trump's son-in-law. You know, and on and on it goes. All this evidence is piling up that there was collusion because they got it taken out of the platform for the Republican convention that there would be sanctions on Russia um, regarding their invasion of Ukraine. I could go on. The evidence is just, you know, really a mountain high at this point. So I am praying that this man gets out of office soon. He's driving us all crazy. And I'm just wondering how you're going to go about impeachment because I feel very strongly in my heart that it needs to happen and it's going to happen. You know, you've raised a few uh, critical issues here that I want to that I want to talk about. Um, you know, you, the investigations that are occurring right now uh, in the House Intelligence Committee as well as the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, the House Intelligence Committee has unfortunately fallen apart uh, because of a whole variety of reasons that we don't need to, to repeat here. Uh, I called for uh, Congressman Nunes's recusal from that. I think he compromised himself. So far, the Senate committee appears to be taking this uh, with the seriousness that it deserves in a bipartisan fashion, which is what's necessary uh, for this inv investigation to continue and actually come out with a credible uh, outcome. Um, I called for Jeff Sessions' uh, recusal from consideration for nomination because of the fact that he did not disclose the truth during his nomination hearings. These are the kinds of things that not only increase frustration but cast doubt uh, in people's minds about the integrity of our government. And. That's why transparency and accountability are so uh, important. Um, on the issue of impeachment, I am doing my homework. I am studying more about the impeachment process. I will just say, you know, I understand the calls for impeachment, but what I am being cautious about and what I uh, give you food for thought about is uh, that if President Trump is impeached, the problems don't go away. Because then you have a Vice President Pence who becomes President Pence. And if you do your research on his positions on many of the issues we've talked about and many of the issues that, that I get phone calls about from people all across the state, uh, the issue of war and peace, he's about as hawkish as they come. Uh, issues relating to the environment, education, health care. Uh, I disagree with so many of the positions that he has. And in some ways, uh, given the fact that he's a former member of Congress and very well connected within the Republican establishment in Washington, uh, he'd be able to 
I believe, be far more effective in furthering his agenda than we have seen so far in President Trump's first 100 days. So we, we've got our work cut out for us on these different issues, and we've, gotta, we've just got to continue going forward. It's, it's not, it's not, these things are never simple, I guess, is my point. Thank you. Our next question is going to be from Travis Rogers. Travis, could you raise your hand? And we'll get the mic coming to you. In the meantime, I'll read the next question. And again, in the interest of time, we've got less than an hour to go. If I could respectfully ask it, try to limit to your question just so we can get to more of them and as many of them as possible. So given the direction of the Trump administration's push to def defund women's health services, reproductive services provided by Planned Parenthood, how will Hawaii prepare for and fund these budget shortfalls, and what are you actively doing to protect women's reproductive rights? Thank you. Yeah, healthcare has been, um, up until the very last day we left to come back to our districts, uh, was really at the forefront of everything that was happening in Washington. Uh, I voted against the bill that came before the House uh, that allowed states to defund uh, Planned Parenthood and others who are providing critical health services to women in our communities. Uh, unfortunately, the Senate passed this bill and the President signed it into law uh, just a few days ago. The American Health Care Act that the Republicans have put forward as their replacement for Obamacare uh, is terrible. It is a terrible bill that undermines health care for our community rather than providing health care for our community. Uh, like we see too often in these health care bills, the influence of the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies was very clear where you've got a health care bill that gives $600 billion in tax cuts and giveaways to these corporations while saying, hey, for our kupuna and our seniors, insurance companies, you can charge them up to five times more than young, healthy people. How does that help those who need care? It doesn't. By cutting hundreds of millions of people's access to care by cuts to Medicaid, you're taking away care from those who most need it and who can least afford it themselves. I've supported and signed on to the Medicare for All bill, HR 676. For a few simple reasons, when you look at these bills, and, and you know the Affordable Care Act did some good, but there was also this signature from the insurance companies that existed in it, and the, and the, pharmace the pharmaceutical companies, where still, as we speak, Medicare is not allowed to negotiate directly with pharmaceutical companies to bring down the cost of prescription drugs for Medicare recipients. They're not allowed to. The VA is. The VA can negotiate those prices down to provide those benefits and reduce costs to veterans, but Medicare cannot. I've signed legislation that would do that, that would allow Medicare to negotiate those prices. I've signed on to legislation that would allow us to import pharmaceutical drugs from Canada where they are offered at a fraction of the price that we are charged here at home. And I mention each of these because our healthcare system is broken. Our healthcare system needs true systemic, real changes so that we have a system that actually supports providing care to people. Access to care, not just access to insurance. It's an important difference. And that's been one of the most heartbreaking things that I've seen over the last few years is People who say, okay, great, I've got health insurance now, but then when they need it the most, they go to the doctor and realize, hey, I've got a $10,000 deductible. I can't afford that. I mean, this is something that impacts people's health, well-being, and life and death. Uh, and our country's got to get serious about doing something real to fix it and change it, uh, not make it worse. And that's unfortunately what the Republican bill that's being put forward does. Thank you. 
Oh, microphone in the back. Aloha, Mrs. Gabbard. My, Aloha. Name, is, my name is Travis Rogers. Um, I am a, a representative of the disabled community on the island, and particularly I want to ask questions about the mental health services. Mm -hmm. Mental health is an issue that every family deals with, every community deals with. It is also a part of health treatment that is neglected. Um, often people with mental health problems do not get the treatment that they need, do not get the medicines that they need, and this leads them to acting out in ways that puts them in prison. And people are languishing in prison simply because they did not get the mental health treatment that they needed when they needed it. How can we better serve the mental health treatment community, the people who need help, the doctors who provide the help, uh, the doctors who prescribe the medicine, and access to more affordable medicine and more availability of treatment in a plethora of illnesses, not just depression and anxiety. Thank you for representing the voice of so many. There's a number of actions that have to be taken. At the federal level, we've got to look at uh, ways to be able to open up and provide and empower those who can provide that support and that care. We've got to look at how we can provide better federal funding and access. But I think overall, you've, you've raised an important issue, which is just raising awareness and understanding around mental health care uh, and challenges and who is affected and what needs to be done as a result. Uh, I can relate in a small way through uh, many of my fellow veterans, friends who I've served with, who have come home from having served in our country's wars uh, physically seeming to be just the same as they were before they left, but carrying invisible wounds that um, don't go away very quickly, if ever. And the stigma that they are experiencing uh, is one that I'm seeing you nodding your head that you can relate to. Uh, the stigma of, you know, for, for some of my veteran friends, of being afraid or unwilling to even ask for help of being labeled as less than or damaged in some way and therefore not getting access to the care that they, they so desperately need. In large part, many of this leads to the 22 veteran suicides that we see every single day across this country. The seriousness of this issue uh, is, is great. Uh, there is some legislation that, that if we get your name and number, we can send you some details about that helped to um, provide better resources, that helped to fund uh, more beds for those who need care. Uh, but I'm glad you brought up the criminal justice impact on our criminal justice system because it is not often talked about. Uh, yet this is one of the, the consequences of not addressing this issue uh, at the root and thinking that somehow putting a Band-Aid over it is going to solve something when it only makes the problem worse. Okay, our next question is gonna be from James Pihana. James, if you could raise your hand, please. There he is. And as we get the mic to you, what is your stand on Native Hawaiian rights? And based on your stand, what actions do you plan to take or legislation that you support regarding Native Hawaiian rights? Good question. You have <laughs> Um, you know, this has been, I, I worked for Senator Akaka in Washington as a staffer a few years back. It was actually between both of my deployments with the Hawaii Army National Guard. And, you know, he's, he's been and continues to be one of our great champions for the Native Hawaiian community. And one thing that I saw back then that was so frustrating and is unfortunately continues through today is such a, a, an ignorance and lack of understanding in Washington about our Native Hawaiian community. People in Washington who flatly deny that we have indigenous people here in Hawaii. I'm not joking, really. If you look at, I mean, history, and if you look at uh, all, the, all, you know, you, you can provide this information, but too many people uh, choose not to be open-minded and choose not to accept it. So this is the challenge that we deal with and that I've, you know, since uh, I first got elected in passing, for example, the reauthorization of the Native Hawaiian Education Act. Uh, Native Hawaiians, unlike, 
unlike Alaska Natives and um, uh, Native Americans are not federally recognized. Uh, therefore, those in Congress question, why should we have special programs for Native Hawaiians? Native Hawaiian education, housing, healthcare, three of the major federal areas uh, that we provide support to preserve and perpetuate uh, Native Hawaiian culture and people within our communities. Uh, there are over 200 places in federal law that Native Hawaiians are referenced, yet this battle is something that we continue every single year. So just briefly, I'll tell you, the Native Hawaiian Education Reauthorization Act this was a, a, an act that both Senator Kaka and Senator Inouye put in place decades ago, had continued, and they continued to get it reauthorized and funded, and just recently uh, it faced uh, expiration. It needed reauthorization again. So we worked to, to prepare the legislation to reauthorize this bill, and we were told left and right, look, the political climate will not allow this to happen, and people were, we were very concerned because you take away this Native Hawaiian Education Act, you take away funding for a lot of our immersion schools. You take away a lot of funding for the the, Hawaii, the Olelo program that we heard uh, from the kids here uh, earlier this evening. Uh, you take away a lot of the funding that allows for our kupuna to go and teach our keiki uh, about culture, about tradition, history, and the future, and that they are the future. So we worked to get this legislation to be included as part of a, a larger education bill that Congress is one of these must pass bills. Uh, it was a bipartisan bill, but even, and we worked with our Alaska Republican counterpart uh, to help get this to the floor. The relationships that I was able to establish early on uh, allowed for the opportunity and the openness to be able to have this conversation with my Republican colleagues that when they saw my amendment come to the floor, there were some groups, activist groups, that started sending messages to Republicans saying, vote against this. This is a racist amendment. This is a bad bill. And rather than accepting that on face value, I started getting phone calls and text messages saying, hey, Tulsi, tell us why you're pushing this amendment. Tell us why it's important to your constituents in Hawaii. And I was able to make that case uh, and thankfully, we were able to pass that, and that bill was reauthorized. So even with so many of the challenges that we face, this is what I and my team try to do our best with every single day that we are working in Washington, is to be inspired by the Aloha spirit here at home, to not be consumed by the divisiveness uh, that is in Washington, and to recognize and actively seek out those opportunities to work in a bipartisan way, to be able to actually inform people, bring people together around things that will help our community, that will help our people, and actually get those things done. Uh, and that's what we've got to be able to continue to do, both in Washington and in our communities here at home. Aloha, uh, Tulsi, Aloha. how are you doing? I'm great, how are you? Oh, I'm doing great. All I've right. Been a while. Yeah. I just admire your spunk and your bravery. Uh, going out to Syria and letting all the people of this uh, area know that you're doing your work uh, and you're a very brave person. As a combat wounded veteran myself, I commend you for your bravery. Thank you for your service. It takes a lot of guts to get out there and face your enemies sometimes. And it takes somebody like you to get out there and bring awareness to everyone back home that you're trying to protect these islands also. I know you're pretty aware of what's going on currently around the world. But what my question was for you tonight is that we have a lot of veterans out there that are homeless. Yeah. When I got back from Vietnam, it was, a, it was pretty hard going through and finding out who I really was after settling back down. They didn't deprogram us. We had a problem with PTSD and a lot of problems with uh, Agent Orange and stuff like this. They were facing uh, job opportunities and uh, health and stuff like this that you got on your agenda today. So I'm just glad. It took me 40 years to get my 100%, but I got it. 
keeping a good straight record and being honorable in everything you do also gives me good credibility to afford a home today. So, I know that the homeless, when I was growing up, there was no such person as a homeless person. So, you know, I just want to say, those people out there that are homeless, get off your feet and do something about it. Go back to school. Find out who you really are. Check in with your doctors or your, your community leaders and get help. Because I had to do the same thing. It's a hard struggle, but we're all aware we have a major problem with homeless here on the islands. Yeah. And one of it, of course, is housing. Yeah. And I know that's how I know your top priorities too. But it's good to see you again. I'm Mahalo. glad you're doing a great job out there. Keep up the good work. Mahalo, Uncle. Mahalo. Thank you for, for bringing up an important issue and for sharing your aloha with me. Uh, I appreciate your service and, and your standing up and speaking for so many of our brothers and sisters who've worn the uniform and who are home facing challenges today. Uh, one of the things that I learned a lot about uh, in 2012 as I was traveling through uh, throughout Hawaii Island, meeting with different veterans was an issue. Um, someone spoke to me about this once I walked in here tonight, but the issue that uh, VA home loans, which is a benefit that veterans earn, were not being approved for Hawaii Island veterans because of water catchment. That water catchment systems were not being approved by the Department of Health and therefore not being approved by the big VA home loans. I couldn't believe this when I learned it, that veterans on Hawaii Island were essentially being discriminated against because of the way this island works. <laughs> so we worked very hard and it took several months, uh, but within that first year we were able to get the VA to the table we were able to get State Department of Health to the table, and we were able to work out a compromise that now allows veterans on Hawaii Island to access the VA home loan guarantee that they've earned. <laughs> and all of you know, with our high cost of living here in Hawaii, uh, the idea of home ownership is out of reach for far too many people. So to be able to open those doors for our veterans, to be able to uh, achieve that home ownership uh, is, is an important thing to address the homelessness, the high cost of living, and these other issues that you talked about, and to make sure that veterans can access the benefits that you've earned. Mahalo. Your next question is from Jesus Del Mar. Jesus, can you raise your hand, please? Yes, the mic is making to you. Is there a plan to become more food self-sufficient since so much food is imported? What can we do to push forward? I just had a few meetings on this earlier today. This is, um, this is an issue that I have been and am working on to see how at the federal level we can better support those who are on the ground here working towards food security, sustainability, energy security. Because food and energy, those are the two things that we import the most uh, and that we end up paying so much for here in Hawaii. Uh, when you look at what happens when the ports shut down, everything gets real, really quick, about how handicapped we are and have frankly allowed ourselves to become here in Hawaii. Uh, there needs to be a coordinated effort between those in the agriculture community the county, the state, and us at the federal level to work together towards uh, this goal of true food security and sustainability. Because right now, we find ourselves in kind of an ad hoc situation where there are some people doing some amazing things. We see people and leaders in certain communities stepping up to the plate saying, all right, here's what we're going to do for our community, which is phenomenal. But this has to be something that is economically viable has to be an economically viable um, possibility for those who are thinking, all right, do I want to go and you know, farm the land like my father or my parents and their parents and their parents have done? Or do I want to go get a job working nine to five somewhere where I'm guaranteed a paycheck every day? So um, there's not an easy answer to this question, but it is an urgent question uh, that 
we all need to work together towards. You know, the, the governor recently talked about increasing local food production by 50% by 2020, which is a great goal, but I've been asking around to farmers and, and folks who've been studying this issue for a long time is where are we now? If we need to increase by 50%, let's look at the metrics of where we are now. How much food are we actually producing for our people today? And I haven't been able to get a straight answer, not because people don't want to give one, but because different people have different definitions of, well, what is food? <laughs> what I like to eat might be different from what you like to eat. <laughs> I might not think your food is good for, for me. Uh, but there's the, the fact that there's not a baseline of metrics to say, okay, we're here, we need to get here by this date, and then, of course, if once you do that, then you say, okay, what's the strategy to get there? What are the programs that we're going to put in place to do that? Uh, I was on Lanai the other night, and there's a, a small farmer there who's gung-ho, and he's, he's, I don't know, he's probably around 60 years old, but he's fired up about um, continuing and growing the small farming community on Lanai. But he says, we don't have a processing plant that we can all use and share as a community. Uh, so, you know, people in, in communities are identifying the needs. They have the desire and the motivation, but we've got to have that, that coordinated strategy in place to be able to achieve that necessary goal of true food security for our state. Aloha. I salute you um, as one veteran to another. I salute for your service and service to your country and being our congresswoman. Thank you um, for your service. There's two topics I want to bring tonight, and, and it's really um, real quick. The first one is important to me because there was a bill that came out that's sponsored by you and Senator uh, Hirono. And what the bill was about the uh, congressional gold medal for World War II Filipino veterans. And maybe later afterwards, I can show you all my father's medals with his purple heart. Wow. Make a uh, brief history of my father. My, my parents were uh, in the Philippines in the war, before the war, during the war, and after the war. But see, my father served in the US Army, and he was General MacArthur's bodyguard. He was a POW. Um, he survived the Death March the Bataan Death March, and he helped John MacArthur form the guerrilla forces in the Philippines and await his return. So my question is, was because I have the article that came out back in December in our local paper, and it didn't mention if um, the Filipino veterans, um, that is this award or medal given to people that are still alive or people like my dad who is deceased. And the second topic I want to mention is that I serve, my family serve every branch of the service as veterans, okay? I served in Korea in the early, in the 70s. And I know how the North Koreans are. Because I served at the DMZ side by side with the ROC Armed Forces and our forces. And to tell you the truth, if I was to give you guys uh, information how sensitive the North Koreans are, anything will touch them off, anything, okay? You spit on the ground, they'll shoot you. You take their picture, they'll shoot you, okay? Stuff like that. So what I'm saying is that we should not provoke the North Korean leader because I have firsthand experience by serving there and I know how they are. Um, we are prepared, our forces are prepared with the Iraq Army, um, ROK, which is uh, Republic of Korea Armed Forces. We're all prepared to do whatever we have to do, but all I'm saying tonight is that we should not provoke the North Korean leader because that's what they train for. They train for war. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to address both of your questions because they are both important. Uh, thank you to you and your father and your family who have sacrificed so much. Uh, he referenced the Congressional Gold Medal being awarded to Filipino World War II veterans. Uh, this was legislation that Senator Maisie Hirono introduced in the Senate and that I introduced in the House 
to provide long overdue recognition to people who served alongside, shoulder to shoulder with American service members uh, and who still to this day have not gotten the recognition that they earned. Uh, in fact, they were promised recognition by our government so long ago and very quickly uh, after the war was over, our federal government reneged on the deal, on their promises, and broke them completely, taking away that recognition for these brave heroes. So we got over 300 co-sponsors in the House uh, for this bill before it passed, uh, and Senator Hirono got over three quarters of the Senate to support her bill uh, as well. Uh, the bill doesn't speak to your question about uh, providing the award. Right now, I think there's about 18,000 Filipino World War II veterans still alive in the world. Um, and so we're working on, a few people have asked that same question, can we provide it also to the families of those who have already passed? So if you make sure we get your information, we'll follow up with you on that. Uh, on the second issue of North Korea, you're, you're uh, exactly right about what the consequences of provocation are. Uh, and, you know, some people make the mistake of saying, well, Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, he's a lunatic. He's crazy. But I have heard from many experts, and when you look at the situation, um, and you, you realize, well, his actions follow a certain form of logic. And it speaks back to this common thread that's come up throughout the night about regime change war. North Korea has nuclear weapons as a deterrent to regime change. That is why they refuse to let go of their nuclear weapons. And when they look at what we did in Libya with Gaddafi, when an agreement was made, say, okay, you denuclearize, we're not gonna come after you, we're gonna allow you to remain in power. And then very soon after we came in, launched another regime change war, toppled him, he was dragged through the street. North Korea is watching this, saying, okay, why should we trust anything when our country has this track record of regime change? So, again, our policies have consequences. So now that we here in Hawaii are staring down the barrel, essentially, of a nuclear threat from North Korea, um, we've got to think through clearly and understand exactly uh, what's going on here. Uh, that it's not just a lone actor, but there are, again, consequences to our policies uh, in the past and the policies that, that we are still playing out today in Syria, that we are still seeing play out today in Syria. Your next question from the floor is from Sarah Carr. Sarah, if you could raise your hand. Yeah, as I bring the mic to you, the question on uh, submitted written, doesn't it bother you that Steve Bannon and some white supremacists like you? You know, I don't, I don't make my decisions on policies based on uh, who agrees with me or who disagrees with me or who likes me, who doesn't like me, uh, what party they may be a part of or anything else. And frankly, the premise of the question is such that it, it creates a situation where I would be in a position of saying, okay, well, if David Duke or white supremacists are against regime change wars, maybe I should be for them. If they are for protecting our environment, maybe I should be against protecting our environment. It's just a ridiculous uh, way to look at things and it undermines the seriousness of these issues that we're facing. And unfortunately, this is a symptom of the climate that we see too often in Washington where a good bill, a good amendment, piece, a, a good piece of legislation comes to the floor and immediately, rather than actually reading it and saying, okay, does this help people or does it hurt people? Rather than actually reading it, immediately there are people on both sides who say, oh, that's a Republican bill, I'm gonna vote against it. It's a Democrat bill, I'm gonna vote against it. How does that allow for progress? How does that allow for debate? How does that allow for us to do our jobs in serving you? 
So too many people are quick to, to look at these superficial issues which undermine, again, the seriousness of what we are actually facing and the real work that needs to be done. And this is our challenge and our opportunity, frankly. We come from the Aloha State. We have the opportunity, and I would say even the responsibility, to carry that Aloha in what we do, in the conversations that we have, in the relationships that we have, both in Washington as well as here in our community at home, so that we can be solutions-oriented, so we can focus on service, focus on doing good, and fighting against things that are not. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Oh, hi. Aloha. Um, thanks for everything you're doing in Washington. And my question is about North Korea. I know you've already answered or spoken to this a lot. But I was just wondering, what is the level of threat that we're currently under? And I guess what always gets to me the most, this goes back to what you're saying in the beginning, is that every time I turn on the international news or the national news, it's always, does Kim Jong-un have a ballistic, intercontinental ballistic missile capable of hitting New York or capable of hitting California? I've been hearing that for like three years. Every time I turn on the news, can he hit New York? We're not, you know, we're over here. So, um, and, you know, he's made his hatred of the U.S. and this, he just his will to target us quite clear. And so I guess my question is, what do we do? What's being done about it? And what's being done specifically to protect Hawaii? I mean, should I be building a bomb shelter or like buying gas masks? And uh, that, yeah, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Every single time we discuss the issue of North Korea in either of the committees that I'm on, my opening line generally is, I represent Hawaii's second congressional district, and North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missiles can hit Hawaii. So the, the, the question is not a, it's not a theoretical question, it is a reality that people here in our state, people here in my district experience and understand and take seriously. Uh, slowly, slowly, people are starting to hear and starting to pay a little bit more attention. Uh, but uh, this is something that I'm continuing to, to push back very strongly against to educate our decision makers about the fact that we've got the 50th state out here um, that is already within range. Uh, there are a number of things that, that can and should be done. Uh, we've passed stronger sanctions bills against North, the, the North Korean regime, the elites in particular. Uh, but the challenge is that many of these sanctions bills, even passed by Congress, uh, have not been truly enforced. Or if they have, they've only been enforced for a, a small window of time so that once you actually start seeing uh, an impact in curbing the escalation, curbing the actions of the North Korean leadership, the sanctions were lifted prematurely. Uh, so that's, that's one uh, area that needs to be fully um, executed. Uh, China has a very critical role to play in this, uh, given the fact that much of North Korea, the North Korean regime's economy uh, comes still through China and their borders uh, and banks associated with China. Uh, so there's a f there are other diplomatic means that need to be um, pushed through in order to try to deal with this threat. Meanwhile, here in Hawaii, what can we do? What should we do? Um, through my work on the committees, we've already started last year to get legislation passed, uh, and we are working uh, urgently now to make sure that we have a defensive system in place for Hawaii. Um, it's not to say that we will have an ironclad shield of protection, but we need to have a, a, a strong missile defense capability here in Hawaii. Uh, the, the mainland, they've got a number of systems in place to protect the mainland. We've got to make sure that we have one specifically for Hawaii that could shoot down a missile uh, should it come our way. Right now on Kauai, her question is, do we have that capability today? Hawaii does not have the capability today to shoot down a defensive missile that could um, intercept one coming towards us. There are others on the mainland that 
do have that capability to protect Hawaii, but I am pushing for Hawaii to have that capability ourselves. On, without getting into too much of the details of, of, of how all these systems work, uh, on Kauai at the Pacific Missile Range facility that currently tests a lot of the different types of defensive um, weapon systems that our country has. Um, we are working to basically see what we can do to um, put a defensive system in operational, not a test site, but an operational site uh, for the protection of Hawaii. Thank you. Hey, as we get the mic to you, how can you help us fill in the funding gaps from this administration here in Hawaii? The president's budget that was put forward, I forget what they called it, like the skinny budget or the trim down budget, I forget what they called it, but it had drastic cuts across all the different federal agencies, uh, including Department of Education, the EPA, Health, Housing and Urban Development. Uh, and many of these cuts, as we learned about them, uh, were objectionable to many Democrats as well as many Republicans. So my hope is that as, you know, every year, every president comes and brings a budget to Congress as a proposal saying, here's what I'd like your budget to look like. But it's actually Congress's role and responsibility to write and pass a budget and an appropriations bill. Uh, so that's something that we are gonna be continuing to work on. We've already begun the process of laying out our priorities for Hawaii specifically. Uh, on this in each of the different areas that are funded by the federal government. Uh, and we're gonna continue working uh, as this budget process goes through. Um, there, there will have to be a serious conversation depending on what that final budget looks like uh, with folks in the state legislature as we look at next, year, uh, next year's session to see what areas will actually uh, be impacted to affect that shortfall. But it's, it's gonna be tough um, given the fact that we're dealing with a one-party rule in Washington. Uh, so I'm not trying to um, you know, paint the picture with rose-colored glasses. Congress, we, we have an opportunity to try to work in a bipartisan way to build a budget that uh, stunts the, the drastic cuts that the administration has put forward. Um, and folks who come from Hawaii to Washington to talk about direct impacts of the budget here in Hawaii, they have counterparts who are doing the same thing with their members of Congress from other states and other districts, Republican and Democrat. So, you know, the voice of the people really will uh, have a great impact on this because it is the real stories of, of people who are impacted in their own lives by these cuts that can help move uh, people to, to do the right thing. So. Um, stay tuned on this one. We've got to keep our eye on it and keep working on it. Uh, thank you for being here and taking my question. I'm here representing HighCop.org, which is a grassroots organization trying to reduce tour helicopter noise over our homes. This is a 40-year problem that just keeps getting worse. And we're getting tired of listening to the FAA and the National Park Service saying they really can't do anything about it. Now Hawaii Volcanoes National Park leads the nations in overflights. And to that end, uh, we pro highcop.org proposed an offshore route where the helicopters could go offshore and then come in on the, the ocean side to, into the lava areas where they want to go. And so far, we have not heard any response from the helicopter pilot companies. So my question is to you, can you please encourage them to uh, maybe voluntarily try this one more time to voluntarily accept that and failing that, failing the regulatory, the regulatory agencies have completely failed here and voluntary agreements have not worked at all. And uh, Congresswoman Patsy Mink had it right in 1993 when H.R. 1696 was proposed to regulate the airspace over the National Park. It never made it out of the committee. And my question to you, please, is would you consider reintroducing that bill? Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for, I know there's a lot of folks here who share your concern about this, uh, and I've spoken with some of your, your local legislators here as well already uh, who are working to try to address this issue. Uh, 
my chief of staff, along with I know Maisie Hirono's chief of staff, I'm not, I think there may have been the other members of the federal delegation there, uh, had a meeting with National Park Service and FAA um, in particular to talk about this issue, as well as some of the helicopter companies. And this, uh, Senator Kai Kahele has been very outspoken on this, as well as others here uh, on Hawaii Island. You're right, there were no answers given at that meeting. Uh, just a lot of problems and challenges and obstacles. Uh, but we have to find a way to work through this. I know that one of the pushbacks that was given of the um, flights over the ocean uh, is that only one company, I believe Blue Hawaii, has the required safety equipment to land on water in an emergency, and the other companies do not. So I can imagine they would probably uh, be opposed to that idea. But regardless, there has to be a workable solution brought forward for the community here. Uh, and one thing that's been uh, a proposed idea that I think makes sense is for the FAA to appoint a local task force leader to address and be the point person on this issue uh, to, to be that conduit between the companies the helicopter companies, the community, the National Park Service, as well as the local elected officials to find a solution because the status quo clearly has been uh, going on for, for far too long and has gotten out of hand. So we're gonna continue to work and engage on this issue. Uh, we have been uh, in touch now for, for the last uh, several months when some folks came and approached me directly to say, hey, we need you to we need you to get on board with this, and so we're going to continue that engagement and look forward to working with you folks in that. Thank you. And in the meantime, what is the status of the Stop Arming Terrorist Act? Thank you for asking that question. I spoke about this bill um, a little bit earlier and what it does. Uh, we need more co-sponsors is really the bottom line. Uh, I need your help in calling our Hawaii delegation to get them onto the bill. It is a bipartisan bill now. We have some of the most progressive Democrats in the House, as well as some of the most conservative Republicans, both signed onto this bill. Another bipartisan opportunity. We've got Senator Rand Paul in the Senate, who recently introduced the exact legislation in the Senate, so we need to get our senators on board. Uh, really, this comes down to informing people and, and raising the awareness about what our country has been doing for all these years. And I'll just mention quickly, I know we're gonna wrap up soon, but uh, this bill addresses uh, generally our country's policies, uh, but also specifically the situation in Syria. That There are two wars that are happening there and have been going, that, that our country's been waging now for quite some time. Uh, the first war is uh, this war that I've talked about, this illegal counterproductive regime change war that needs to end, that has cost so many lives, created refugees, and caused such devastation, and actually strengthened these terrorist groups. And the second war is counterproductive, to, is, is diametrically opposed to that war because it's the war to defeat terrorist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, who have such strongholds in Syria. These are terrorist groups. Al-Qaeda attacked us on 9-11. ISIS continues to pose a threat to us. This is a war that we've got to win. Uh, so we need to get our uh, legislators and lawmakers understanding the reality of the situation there to sign on to the Stop Arming Terrorist Bill so that we stop fueling this regime change war in Syria. And let's get serious about taking those dollars, those billions and billions of dollars we've spent there in Syria alone, reinvesting in those dollars in our community right here at home, because we can't afford to do both. Um, I, I just Where wanna, I'm over here. Oh, hi, hi. okay, thank you. Hi, um, thank you, thank you for being here, thank you for taking my question. Um, I've emailed you, I've called, I've met with a lot of your representatives here, and I really appreciate this. I know we're almost out of time, but this is a really important question to me. Um, and you said earlier, our actions have led to unintentional human suffering when referencing war, and you've talked about that a couple of times. And I would really like to talk about where your actions have led to what I believe was unintentional human suffering, 
Um, and that's in regards to Bill 54 when you were on the county council in Honolulu. And um, so that was back in 2011. And I think if you fully understood the results of that bill, and for those of you who don't know about that, that was a, a, house, a homeless uh, criminalization bill taking people's personal possessions and throwing them away. And we've seen the results and that this is not effective. It's not a compassionate solution to work with our most vulnerable population, which is mostly, not mostly, but largely made up of, um, of veterans, which I know you work hard for, and um, Native Hawaiian population. And so I'm just wondering what you'd be willing to do to kind of step up and ho'oponopono with some of the um, homeless advocates. And I know you've done some incredible things for the homeless population since this original bill, but we keep expanding, or Honolulu in particular keeps expanding the sit-lie bans, which have been proven by UH study to not be effective. And I just want to know going forward what compassionate solutions you have to continue to help the homeless population because a lot of us in this room are maybe just a few paychecks away from being in that same situation. And to have their only personal possessions thrown away um, or put away and then they have to pay a fine that they can't possibly pay to get those possessions back, uh, it just seems so counter to what you usually stand for. And I'm proud to wear your shirt. I'm proud to vote for you. I'm proud to sign wave for you. I'm really proud to have you as my representative. But I just don't understand how you could have um, enacted such a bill and supported such a bill and why you won't speak out against it now with this platform that you have. Thank you. Thank you. And during my time uh, as a member of the Honolulu City Council, I represented an urban part of Honolulu. And this bill came about out of uh, a concern for safety that I received predominantly from a lot of uh, elderly and disabled within our community, that they were finding it a safety hazard to be able to go, uh, that they were unable to go through public walkways, sidewalks, and thoroughfares uh, because of people who had either set up tents or who had their belongings that were blocking that public thoroughfare. Uh, so the bill did, provide for uh, the warn a warning system to be in place. It was, not, um, it, it was not to just go in and immediately grab people's belongings, but it was a, a bill that was introduced and passed to address the safety hazard in public thoroughfares specifically. Uh, what can we do and what uh, are we doing? Uh, at the federal level, we have and continue to try to pass uh, specific housing uh, programs to be able to help get those who are houseless or homeless off of the streets, to be able to help provide funding for those who are working through transitions, uh, and also understand and recognize the complexities of which we're dealing with here that is not um, easily addressed just with one. Mental health challenges is one issue making sure that those services are there and available to be provided. Substance abuse is another issue, helping to make sure that those services uh, are there. Uh, and then there are those who um, need that transitional help to be able to, maybe they're working a full-time job and they can't make that first rent paycheck. So we've gotta be holistic in our uh, addressing this issue and actually getting to um, the root cause of it in a way that will help people uh, empower themselves and, and get their lives back to where they want them to be. And that's something that I will continue to do, uh, both at the federal level and looking to see how I can support those who are working hard here uh, at the local level. Okay, we're gonna take one last question from the floor, and that's from Margaret Willie. Margaret. Um, hi, Tulsi. Aloha, Margaret. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for directing us to that it's not only on the national level, it's on the state and local level. And there's a great deal that we have an opportunity to do right now in this state legislature and where they ignore a lot of our Democratic Party priorities and we all need to work on that. Um, my question for you is what more can we do to support you in terms of being an independent, fearless voice, whether that's on issues or Democratic Party 
you know, national people in Washington where they're saying, well, she may be supported back in Hawaii, but here in Washington now she's going downhill, you know, that type. But what can we do just so that you stay strong and we help to empower you and your independence, whether we agree with every vote you make or whether we um, sometimes disagree, but that we believe in you and want to help you. Thank, Thank you. you. Those guys in Washington have no idea what Hawaii is about and who is Hawaii. And I'm glad that I fit in here and not there. You know, you, you, you said a few things, Margaret. Um, how you can support me is just by continuing to support uh, the work, whether it's issues at the federal level or, as you mentioned, issues here at the local level. The best way that we can help each other, the best way that we can help our community uh, is by taking action, by being involved, being engaged on these issues that are so important to all of us, to our today and for our future. Uh, we can't afford to be complacent. Too many folks still stay home on election day because they don't feel like their vote makes a difference. <laughs> Elections have consequences. You know, before you, I did write a letter, but I guess they didn't pick mine up. But I'm a native Hawaiian from Keokaha, you know, and uh, what I wanted to say is my husband fought in the Korean War. And he was drafted by the United States from America. He was drafted in December, and three months later, he, he was wounded and spent four years at Tripler. Now, you know, we don't see ourselves as natives, but we don't care about them. You know, he loved this country. That's why he went out to fight for it. You know. And so I thought that, you know, um, I just make mention of that. But now, you know, he died about seven years ago. And they haven't covered me here on a big island, you know, for medical. They tell me that because I'm covered, because he was 100% disabled veteran, and I'm totally covered, except for the medical. I would have to catch a plane if I'm sick to go to Honolulu. But it costs so much money on our pension for me to go back and forth. You know, just to get, and I haven't been well for a long time. In four years, I'll be 90 years old. Still, still strong, there. Auntie. I'm still taking care of my grandkids, and I'm still teaching them to love our country. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you and your husband for your service, your ohana. Um, if you see one of my staff here before you leave tonight, we can try to help work with you and the, to get to the VA to address some of the issues that you raised uh, because you, you clearly um, have, have earned and deserve those, those benefits. So thank you very much and thanks for coming this evening. And, and with that, I'll just say in closing, um, thank you all for taking the time to come out this evening. Uh, it is wonderful to be home and to be with so many people who are truly living aloha. Uh, and that's what it comes down to. Thank you, that we can work together to actually make progress for all of Hawaii. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for you. I'm grateful to serve you and work for you in Washington. Mahalo. Thank you.